Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and I have a little secret. My co-host is the original bassist for the band Hep Alien. He is the very, very talented captain. Yeah, the original rockers of Stars Hollow. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are sipping on some Smittix Irish Red. When these babies are nice and cold, they are super clean and downright refreshing with a rich ruby color. ABV, 4.5%. And the grade of the garage, three and a half bottle caps out of five. And today we're sipping on cold beers, thanks to our good friends right here. First up, we have a cheers to Brooke and Wendell north carolina and a big shout to jillian in virginia beach virginia here's a double cheers to stacy and ryan or should i say rb in pomfret maryland and a big shout out to lisa in carson city nevada next up we have a cheers to manny from descanso california and last but certainly not least we have jamie in dothan alabama Thanks for contributing to this week's beer fund. And if you would like to be beer buddies with me, find me on the untapped app. My handle, you guessed it, True Crime Garage. Yeah, and for everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Nancy, Annie's mother, jumped on an overnight flight to Dublin. She arrived on Tuesday, March 30th, and went straight to the local Gardee station to report her daughter missing. Nancy assured the Gardee that her daughter would not have just left. She was happy and thrilled to be living in Ireland. Even stranger, Annie's possessions, anything that you would anticipate somebody taking with them if they planned on leaving, they were all found right where Annie left them in the flat. The Gardee's investigation got off to a slow start. Annie's missing photo and public appeal for information were not issued for another seven days. This is seven days after her mother arrived. Annie's father joined Nancy in Dublin for the search of their daughter. The McCarrick's together stayed for six weeks working with the Gardee on the investigation. The Gardee put together that Annie had called her friend Anne that day, asking her to go hiking, that Annie had been possibly seen taking this bus in the direction of Ennis Carey, which then naturally kind of shifted the focus of their investigation from the Sandy Mount area to the Ennis Carey area. Right. And then, of course, we have the possible sightings of her at the post office and the pub. After that, there was nothing frustrated with the lack of progress. The McCarrick's hired a seasoned private investigator recommended to them by the U S embassy. One local printer even offered to print up 10,000 flyers advertising Annie's disappearance, which included her picture and her description, which included the outfit. They believe she was wearing that day, a dark tweed jacket, right. ox blood colored boots, jeans, and a large, satchel type bag which her mother nancy says annie took with her everywhere this description of her clothes is pretty much backed up by what we saw on the bank cctv footage with their private investigator the mccarrick's canvassed the ennis area going door to door with annie's photo to all of the homes between the small village and johnny fox's pub Gardee officers spoke with all of Annie's friends. Two former boyfriends were questioned, although Gardee would not address whether they were actually suspects. Right. All those with records of sexual assault in the vicinity were questioned. Official searches were conducted. Hundreds of acres were, in fact, searched in this investigation. 
a computer generated sketch of the man in the wax jacket supposedly seen by the bouncer was circulated describing this man as being in his mid twenties, five foot nine inches to five foot 10 inches tall with dark Brown hair, a media blitz saturated the news with photos and details about Annie resulting in hundreds of tips. The McCarrick's desperate even consulted psychics in in this investigation. But despite all of these efforts, no trace of Annie McCarrick has ever, has ever been found. The private investigator hired by the McCarrick family, this is Brian McCarthy says that after looking into Annie's disappearance and to the following all the leads that he could find. And I couldn't get a great detailed answer for this here, captain, but he says the private investigator says he does not believe that the woman seen at Johnny Fox's that night was Annie. Yeah. Everybody has their own beliefs and, and you wonder, is that coming from evidence or is that just coming from a gut feeling this case is weird because when we look at something like Brian Schaefer, again, so weird to me that these missing person cases, Schaefer goes into a bar. He's last seen on, on surveillance. Mara Murray, she's last seen at, at an ATM. Now we have Annie's case. She was last seen that day that she went missing at that the CCTV footage. Mm-hmm. It, it makes that footage so much more haunting, but yeah, but yeah, it's, um, this one's different and it feels different because you can't really have the argument of normally with the missing person case you go, okay, well, is there a reason they would want to run away? She kind of already did. She, yeah, uh, she's living elsewhere. Yep. She's living across the pond thousands of miles away from her family, thousands of miles away from where she grew up. So that kind of already happened, but she didn't do so in a way where she wanted to lessen contact with her family. She was still close with her family. Her mother's coming to visit. Yes, her father didn't want her to go back, but at some point your family gets over that. So there's no if she wanted to lose contact with her past or her family, all she had to do is just not answer a phone anymore. Do you look, and I know that rules have changed since nine 11. So this being 1993 may not really apply to what I'm thinking now, but do you need a passport to travel from country to country in Europe? Because a lot of no. times you can just hop, hop on a train and, and go to another country. Right. Where in the U S we're not so we're not built like that. You know, it's, we're traveling to another state often, but since nine 11, you need a passport to get to Canada. Right. You didn't before, but what I'm getting at here, I only bring that up because we do know her passport was found in her apartment. Right. So if she was planning on leaving, she's already kind of slowing down her travel in some manner by not taking that with her. I could be wrong, but I would, I still think to this day, you just need your ID to get to certain countries that you don't even need your passport over in the UK. What did Jerry Seinfeld say about a driver's license? What What is required to have a driver's license? Apparently just a face, Yeah, <laughs> you know, for the picture taking process. And you need no hands. Sadly, Captain, after a year long investigation, Gardee turned up really nothing new in this case. Well, again, there's also thousands of sightings yeah. that they had to run down and, when you think about investigating anything, can you imagine every time you get a call saying, oh, we think we saw her at this restaurant or we think we saw her here and how many five foot six to five foot 10 Burnett Americans did somebody meet and go, oh my God, I think that's Annie. So the amount of work that they had to put into this case was, was tremendous. Nancy and John, her parents returned to the U S this months earlier, you know, we're at the year long portion of the investigation now on our timeline. They, they went back months earlier, but they did go back to Ireland again in, uh, once more this on the first anniversary of her disappearance, Right. hopeful that the publicity just from their visit 
and the reward money, which was now $150,000, I'm guessing that's in dollars, uh, was announced. They were hoping that this would spur some type of movement on the case. It did not. Nothing new about Annie's case was reported until October of 2008. Yeah. When an article in the Irish Times reported the following, uh, and bear with me as I read through this, Gardee investigating the disappearance of and presumed murder of American student Annie McCar- McCarrick have interviewed two new suspects. The suspects were identified after the Gardee's cold case review squad recommended a reinvestigation of the case by Gardee in Bray County, Wicklow. The case was formally handed over during the summer and has now resulted in the identification of two new suspects in the presumed murder of the New Yorker. The Irish Times understands the investigating team selected the two men for interview based on a review of statements taken when Miss McCarrick disappeared 15 years ago and also based on more recent information from members of the public. Gardee believe Miss Carrick was last seen in Johnny Fox's pub in Glen Collin, County Wicklow, on March 26, 1993. So we have the private investigator who says, I don't think she was ever there. Right. We have this article that makes it sound like Gardee investigators believe that she was at Johnny Fox's. Um, yeah. And then it goes on to mention a few different things. I'm going to kind of skip around here. Um they're mentioning all this stating while this was going on in 93, while a convicted jailed rapist has long been noted in the media as a suspect, neither of these two men that were interviewed is neither of them were arrested or considered to be a a prisoner at any time. And as we said, uh, it doesn't sound like they were officially suspects. And it does say in this article that neither of them have a criminal record. But what is interesting is they're saying we went back and we're reviewing all of the old information that we did have. And because of this, we see this in a lot of cases when they go cold and you hand them over to new investigators. They go, oh, wait a second. This lead and this lead, these were potential leads that we do not believe were properly followed up on at that time right so or had nowhere to go at that time yeah so now we're going to talk to these two individuals and try to clear some things up at least it's a lead that they're following up further on but we don't know the nature of those interviews and right, we why? do know that they weren't considered as far as the media knows to be actual suspects well the laws over there are different as well too because if you're accused of a sexual assault or rape uh, as a male they do not use your name so and i've thought about this just in the last couple days because there was some charges against uh possibly charges against a ufc fighter conor mcgregor that have never really hit the mainstream media in america but a lot of that is we're not clear if he was charged or not because they don't use the person's name so on one sense, you think, well, that's this country protecting the males, but on on some level, maybe it's a way to, by everything being a little more closed down and a little more controlled by the courts, maybe it's allowing for the female accusers or the female victims to be able to come forward in such a way that they they feel more likely to come forward if that makes any sense well i think where we need to go from from here captain is we need to go through what we introduced to everyone in the trailer which is ireland's vanishing triangle and i i do want to make a special note here about my research for these cases that we're about to get into I relied quite a bit extensively, in fact, on a book called Missing Presumed by Alan Bailey. Yeah, I kept on hearing that uh, in the different documentaries and things. They would talk about that book. I'm, I'm assuming it's pretty well written. Something that we have yet to mention, which goes along with the Vanishing Triangle, is the investigative initiative called Operation Trace. 
So in the time period between 1993 and 1998, a significant number of women vanished in an 80 mile area outside of Dublin in the Leinster area and what became known as the vanishing triangle. Six of these cases are particularly well known. So let's take a brief look at these disappearances, which did begin with Annie McCarrick's case. So following her disappearance, we have the disappearance of Jojo Dollard. On November 9th, 1995, 21-year-old Josephine, known better as Jojo Dollard, went missing. She was a waitress who lived with her sister in Callan, a small town in the county of Kilkenny. That Thursday night, she met with friends in Dublin, quite a ways from home and planned to return home by bus. However, she missed the last bus and started hitchhiking, which as we said, was fairly common during this time. Her first two rides took her halfway home to the town of Moen. And I hope I have that right. I probably don't M O O N E where she called a friend from a phone booth. This is around midnight. Captain. She told her friend, that she was hitching a ride and waiting for another ride to come along. Multiple witnesses later told the guardee that she saw that they saw a young woman talking in the phone booth, but with the door open and she's still trying to thumb a ride, even though she's on the phone. Apparently while she's on the phone with her friend, she tells the friend, Hey, hold on a minute. She's gone for about 30 seconds before returning to the phone and saying to the friend, I have a lift. I'm off. A witness driving by told police that she saw a car pull over near that phone booth and saw a woman get into a vehicle. Jojo Dollard was never seen again. Gardee officers spoke with the two drivers that picked up Jojo and drove her, you know, as far uh, that far that night. But again, after that point, it's, it's really a mystery. We also have 17 year old Sierra Breen who went missing from the seaside town of Dundalk. And this is on February 13th, 1997. Sierra's mother said that she and Sierra went to bed around midnight. And when she got up about two in the morning, she noticed that her daughter was gone. They found the latch to her window. It, it was unlocked. The general thought here, and this is the opinion of her mother and the guardee, was that at some point in the night, Sierra decided to leave on her own and left the window, you know, went out the window, leaving it unlocked so that whenever she was going to sneak back into the home, she would have a way in. She, too, has never been seen since. Then in August of 1996, in the town of Tullamar, a 25-year-old hairdresser named Fiona Pender went missing. She is reported to be seven months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. She's last seen at an apartment that she shared with her boyfriend, John Thompson. He says he left for work to go work on his family farm at 6 a.m. It was thought that she may have gone out uh, after some time after he left. But what we do know is she is never seen again after this statement of John Thompson saying, Hey, I left and she was, she was fine at the time. A friend stopped by her apartment later that day, but the curtains were drawn. So she assumed Fiona was asleep and you know, nobody answers the door. Her family does report her missing. This was not until the next day, extensive searches and inquiries turned up nothing. We have a second Fiona to go through as well here, Captain. This is in February of 1998. Fiona Sennett disappeared after leaving Butler's Pub in Wexford. She had recently suffered a breakup with the father of her child, but everyone says she was in good spirits and had social plans she looked forward to, this according to her family. That night, she met up with friends at the pub, and left at closing time to walk a mile along country roads to her home. This is the last sighting of Fiona. She was not reported missing for 10 days. Her home uh, that she was renting at the time 
provided no clues that I could find in any of the reports. I think the thought here, Captain, is that she never made it back to her home that night. Right. In July of 98, still another mysterious disappearance. This was, this is the tipping point. Okay. You talked about earlier, oh, nobody should be hitchhiking. We got all these missing women. This here is the we tipping point. We should have known this from the 70s, though. In our timeline. Yeah, yeah, different histories. Uh, we certainly learned our lesson, unfortunately, here in the 70s uh, in the United States. But again, this is when hysteria is going to set in, at least in the sense of the the press and in the media, for fears of a possible serial killer. This comes about when we have the disappearance of an 18-year-old student teacher, Deirdre Jacob. As with Annie's case, Deirdre spent the day running errands in her hometown. Uh, she was in Newbridge. Thanks to CCTV footage, it is known that Deirdre hit the bank at 2.30 p.m., the post office 10 minutes later, and also went to the grocery store. She also visited her grandmother at the sweet shop she owned in town called, she called a friend from a phone kiosk and met some friends at a pub. She was last seen exchanging greetings with a neighbor. According to one article, quote, neighbors saw her about 200 yards from her home and then suddenly she was gone. She was standing at the side of the road about to cross over the street and then she was gone. According to articles from the time, it was established that Deirdre never made it to her front door. She was never seen again, despite swift and massive official searches for her. Her family has some kind of hope, it sounds like, that perhaps she ran off to start a new life. But of course, they know how unlikely this is. In the book Missing Presumed by Alan Bailey, he writes... It was as if the earth had opened and swallowed her whole. That's like every missing person case though, right? Like Yeah, a lot of them. It's it's almost like there's another dimension that they just slip into. Well, you're hitting on something here that I wanted to really make sure that we pointed out with that of Annie's case. Okay, that's what we're spotlighting in these two episodes, Annie's case. Yes, we have these other ones to consider. But with her case, 1993, I feel like the problems, all the things that are problematic about her case and the investigation, we wouldn't have those problems in 2020. There would have been a lot more cameras going on. Right. There, the, cell phone ping technology. Yeah. Cell phones. We would have street cameras, business cameras. We might even have cameras on these buses. And what I'm pointing out here is not so much so it's the correction of the timeline and her whereabouts along that timeline. We, we mentioned that a lot of those sightings, while some of them are very believable, they are officially unconfirmed. So we don't know what time she went missing. We don't know what account is the first false one, right? If somebody right. says, Hey, I saw her at the post office and she wasn't, we, we have other video evidence to prove that she never made it to that post office. We know something happened before right. that potential site. Yeah. Or you take the pub, for example, with technology now, or, or people constantly going to places, all oh, this is a heavy, uh, tourist attraction. Guess what happens at heavy tourist attractions? Pictures are taken. And would there be a way with the 300 and some people there taking pictures? Could we could we have got picture of Annie like in the background of a picture to confirm that she actually made it to that pub? Yeah. And, and with all of these unexplained disappearances of young ladies in a relatively, I mean, these are low risk lifestyles that most of these ladies are living. That's when we start seeing the headlines in the Irish media that are going to talk about a possible serial killer preying on women in the areas around Dublin. So we see a bit of a media frenzy here with this. Now, after Deidre disappeared in 1998, then uh, Gardee Commissioner Pat Byrne established Operation Trace under an FBI-trained assistant commissioner named John Hickey to investigate possible links between 
the original six cases, the two Fionas, Annie, Jojo, Sierra, and Deirdre. Commissioner Byrne believed that all six missing women had been murdered, although it was premature to suggest that the cases were, in fact, linked. Uh, One thing I want to point out here, Captain, when we talk about this vanishing triangle or what kind of list, how many victims we possibly have, I've seen this list with as with as few as six victims who we just mentioned, it seems pretty common that eight is the common number reported. Right. But I've also seen this to include up to 15 strange occurrences and two of them being murders that took place before Annie McCarrick went dis went missing. Right. What I do want to point out though, again, eight seems to be the most common number. What's interesting to me about that number eight is within a five year and four month time span, we have eight women who are all, I mean, within a, what, 15 years of one another, they all go missing and there, this is like no trace of them is ever found. They don't find a body. We talked about that in the trailer, how at some point, they're offering up a reward that just results in into leading investigators to an actual body. Right. You have with missing persons, you have you have some terrible, terrible things working against you in your investigation. A murder can be easier to investigate than a missing persons case, especially when you have the commissioner coming out and saying, hey, because there's been no activity. We believe that these eight missing women have been murdered. We don't know if there's a link between any of them, but the thing that they don't have that you would have in a murder investigation, you don't have a body, which, which can contain a lot of evidence, a lot of clues, a lot of leads. You don't have a crime scene. So you're really working against it right away. And have you seen footage of the surrounding areas that took place in these searches? Some of them, yes. Yeah, I mean, there's some spots that are so desolate, and it's almost like the perfect grounds to be able to go hide a body or to bury a body. Here's the other thing, too. We talked, we referenced that um, the Wicklow area several times. Yeah. And what we do know is when you look at when you look at lists that contain the 15 that I had mentioned, they found some bodies in that Wick, in the Wicklow Mountains is what it's often referred to as. The more I kept reading about this captain, I started wondering like you know how like here we say all oh, the you know like kind of kind of a common dumping ground right to hide bodies be it even when they're the crimes are perpetrated by by different individuals. It, you know, is it like the place beyond the pines where all oh, they everyone's kind of when you need a place to dump a body, this is where you go. But one thing that I think that we see here, and I'm, I'm not going to, um, I don't want to mislead anybody or take them down any roads that we don't have to go down because we have a lot still to get to there. There's no part of me that believes all 15 of these cases are in fact connected. There's no part of me that believes all eight of these cases are in fact connected There are, yes, there are some similarities. However, we have in some of these cases where individuals close to the missing person, to the victim, have been suspected of being involved in their disappearance. Where we don't have that with Annie. Annie's is a little more mysterious. And part of that, too, is she's not from there. She's not from the area. She's not lived there her whole life. She has a, a, a shorter time span and a smaller circle of people, and yet she goes missing, and we don't have any clue as to where she is. Thank you for, for singing that for yeah. us. It didn't really take me that long. No, 
just you know like one take as me in the shower <laughs> I, get, I get a little higher so i do want to mention here captain we talked about this book missing presumed and really in this case in these cases here there's really nobody more qualified for this type of book because alan bailey spent 13 years as the national coordinator for the Operation Trace Task Force. The task force eventually came to the conclusion that there was no serial killer involved. In a statement that we would see uh, by Bailey, told to the Wicklow Voice newspaper in 2014, he said, quote, in the end, we could name viable independent suspects in five of the cases. On the other hand, Others believe that Annie McCarrick, Deidre Jacob, and Jojo Dullard are all linked in some form or fashion, that it is likely that one killer is responsible for those three disappearances. Right. Gardee Assistant Commissioner Martin Donellan, who was the initial lead investigator on Annie's case, spoke with the Irish Times about 20 years later, this is in 2013, he said to him the similarities between the cases of Annie, Jojo, and Deidre could not be ignored. These were, he considered, they all go missing around the same area, around the same time of day. There was just too many possible similarities for him to to set that aside. Now, though, I think we should get into some persons of interest who we know were considered in Annie's case. First, this is according to the April 2019 University Express article called Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. We cited this article earlier, in fact. But they say that Gardee originally focused on a man Annie knew. This was based on information gathered from one of her friends that Annie had a liaison with someone she had worked with. According to the friend, Annie had seen this man on the Saturday before her disappearance, and she told her friend that she had, quote, let things get out of hand with him and just wanted to forget about the whole thing. Gardee questioned the man and blew apart the alibi he provided, which this, of course, is going to cast further suspicion on him. You provide an alibi that doesn't seem to be true. After intensive questioning, the man admitted to the the interlude with Annie and told police he had lied to hide from his girlfriend the fact that he was cheating with Annie. Doucheburger. According to this article, the Gardee took this at face value, and it looks like never they never revisited this man in question. Now, the book missing, presumed, also dismissed this man as a suspect. This leads us to Robert Howard. In October of 2005, the BBC News reported that the Gardee investigating the missing women of the Vanishing Triangle had filed paperwork to interview a convicted murderer named Robert Howard. He's 61 years old, known in the press as the werewolf. Howard's records have been sealed, but had recently been opened, and the press determined that Howard had multiple convictions for rape, murder, and child abuse. The files indicated that police in both Ireland and England suspected that Howard may be linked to the disappearance of up to six women. Two cases in particular were being examined to see if Howard could be responsible. These were the cases of Jojo Dollard and Annie McCarrick. Since being convicted in 2003, Howard was serving a life sentence for the 2001 rape and murder of a 14-year-old girl in London. Her name is Hannah Williams. Her body was found two years after she went missing. Howard reportedly had up to 12 addresses in various parts of Ireland throughout the 1990s. He was linked to a sexual attack on a teenage girl in Dublin in 1993, the same year that Annie vanished. So this very dangerous werewolf man is reported or believed to possibly have been in the area 
the same about the same time that Annie goes missing. Right. Here we have one that I know you're going to like, Captain. In fact, I shouldn't say going to like. I think you do like it. This is the IRA Hitman. So in 2009. Right. Hitman. Okay, keep going. A retired detective. That's what I titled it. It might be. You might notice something else. In 2009, a retired detective sergeant. Uh, remember, we have Alan Bailey revealed that he had a very reliable source who told him what happened to Annie. He says this theory is explored in depth in his book. Now, according to Bailey, this man had been seen by the bouncer at Johnny Fox's paying for Annie. So under this theory, Annie was at Johnny Fox's that night with this man who happens to be a, what, what I'm calling a hitman. He's a hitman for the West Belfast Brigade of the Irish Republican Army, or IRA. Listeners might recall that the IRA was an extremist militant group which fought to end British rule of Ireland and ensure unification of the Irish people under the democratic government. This supposed hitman had fled from murder charges in North Ireland and was on the lam in the Republic of Ireland, living with some friends in a safe house near Johnny Fox's. According to Bailey's source, the hitman and Annie got a little drunk, and the hitman told Annie things he's not supposed to talk about. Mm -hmm. So this is talking about illegal activities and about his organization. Might have talked about the murder charges. Well, when he realized that he had related secret information to her, he recognized that he needed to get rid of Annie. He either offered her a ride or otherwise lured her into his Ford Sierra while making sure that they were not seen leaving Johnny Fox's together. After Annie and the hitman left in his vehicle, He says he strangled her and hid her body under some bushes. When he told his colleagues what he had done at the safe house. Yeah, they, they, well, I don't, I don't have information if it was the people at the safe house, but I think that's a safe assumption. Yeah. He said they worked to help dispose of her body more thoroughly somewhere in the Wicklow mountains where she would never be found. Yeah. They buried her. Apparently this IRA, Hitman later reportedly returned to Northern Ireland, where it is believed that he may have committed a sexual assault, to which he then fled to America. It seems like the the last known place he was possibly living was in the state of Texas. Right, not, but, right, but it wasn't that he fled; that the IRA helped him leave. Yeah. So to make that clear, this is a story being told to. Um, Mr. Bailey about what possibly happened to Annie that night. Yeah. And what's tough about this and the reason why this makes a lot of sense to me is that you have another member of the IRA coming forward and basically saying, Hey, by the way, that was Annie. And this guy that was a part of the IRA murdered her. And we, a collective group of people helped cover it up. So by coming forward, you're not you're not just making the claim that, again, we've seen it in several cases where somebody comes forward and makes a claim against somebody else, and maybe they're more involved than what they're stating, but they're still involved. So you have somebody coming forward and not coming forward in the greatest of light. I got to come forward and confess against this guy, but I also have to conf- I have to confess against myself. Now, on top of that, I have to confess against other individuals that I know are horrible individuals. I would like to know more details of this theory that's related to Mr. Bailey, because I think where it falls short, we still have no body. There's there's no one right. to lead us to where Annie is. If right, there, but again, if, if you look at this area, it's going to be hard for you to remember unless you put her in a certain area based off of a certain landmark, you would, it'd be very difficult. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of acres that they could have buried her. I can get on board with that. 
I yeah. can see that. So, but the other problem is start looking up the IRA and sexual assaults. I mean, there's multiple individuals that rape children that they covered that up. There's sexual assaults they covered up. They were covering up murders. People that should have been charged with crimes and they were having them, you know, they were sending them to America so they wouldn't have to face these criminal charges. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really do like about the eyewitness at the bar was he even states in his initial thing, okay, flat chest, uh, we we have uh, broad shoulders, a militant haircut. Mm-hmm. And I just think with that eyewitness account, with the eyewitness account, the person that knew her saw her in line to put her on a bus that would put her in that area, that's some evidence that she's in that area. And then, like I said, the other guy coming forward. And then why does it, it's going to lead to a dead end anyways because the IRA is covering up all this nonsense that all their members have been a part of. Mm -hmm. And like I said, to even explore some of these claims, I didn't see anything on the first five or six pages of Google as you search because they're, they're showing all these other cases that the IRA has covered up or, or sent people away so they couldn't be charged with crimes. It's horrible. So that leads us to a man that's probably better known in this case or these cases, and his name is Larry Murphy. Now, according to the Irish American, uh, which is a publication and many other sources, there is a prime suspect in Annie's disappearance, at least among the media. This is the convicted rapist and attempted murderer, Larry Murphy age 35, known in the press as the Beast of Bolton Glass. Carpenter, some really bad names in this case. He's a, well, <laughs> they're referring to towns and villages. Right. Uh, car- he's a carpenter and handyman at one time. He was living in Wicklow County in 2000 and apparently had no criminal record when he abducted and repeatedly raped a 28-year-old woman who was walking alone in a parking lot after closing down her business. He was stalking this woman, watched her routines. He hid his car nearby so he wouldn't be seen on camera. He's waiting there for her, and as she goes to get into her vehicle, He shoved her inside, tied her up, removed her shoes, and drove to his car where he transferred the victim to his trunk and drove off with her. He drove her to a remote forest road in the Wicklow Mountains where he's attacking her and raping her, and it looks like he's about to kill her, but the headlights of another vehicle suddenly shine on his vehicle. Inside, we have two hunters. Their names are Trevor Moody and Ken Jones. They saw that this woman is being attacked, and they go to try to rescue the woman, to which Larry fled, but the woman survived and was able to later describe him. And furthermore, one of the hunters, Trevor, knew Larry's name. It was somebody he knew. It turned out that Larry had a history of violence toward women, including one whom he had tried to strangle, but these incidents had never been reported. And Trevor had encountered Murphy in a pub just a week before this, where a female friend told Trevor that Murphy was frightening and creepy. Yeah. When Gardy showed up at Murphy's home after the rape and attempted murder, his wife asked what was going on. And the Gardy res- to which I'm sorry, Murphy responds I raped a girl last night. Larry was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 15 years. However, he only served 10 years and was released in 2010, moving around Europe until he was inevitably recognized and then moving on. Mm -hmm. He was living in the Netherlands with another convicted rapist when the media tracked him down, and so he moved on again. Apparently, sightings of him, even false ones, by residents of various small towns have caused near- mass hysteria because of Murphy's connection in the eyes of the public to the missing women. It is believed that he has returned to Ireland at some point and is living somewhere 
with his head down and unbeknownst to his neighbors. Now, Murphy is considered to be a very, very serious suspect for Annie's disappearance, as well as some of the others, by the Irish press at least, for a few reasons. One, it, it, it seems that he was living in the area at the time. Two, his known motive was to abduct, rape, and asphyxiate young women walking alone in daytime, committing his heinous acts in the Wicklow Mountains, where it is believed that Annie possibly was heading on that day in question. Right. Murphy fits the description of the man allegedly seen with Annie at the pub. He has been described as having boy next door looks. Also, Murphy made some comments during his interrogation that betrayed the fact that he had likely done this before. When being questioned about the young woman, he was eventually convicted of attacking. He says, quote, well, she's alive, isn't she? She was lucky. <sighs> this, this almost giving off the impression like there might be others that have not gone away. Scenario where you have a bunch of people going missing stops. Yeah. So that's why a lot of people believe that he's connected to more of these cases. And like you said, I, I think you can you say all eight are connected or all 15 are connected? I think that would be irresponsible, but are a handful of them connected very possibly. And is, right. is Murphy responsible for, for those? maybe three of these? Yeah, very possible. It seems like he's a serious, serious suspect in the Deidre, Deirdre case as well. Right. Um, something like later, many, many years later, they found his phone number was believed to be in the possession of Deirdre right. at the time that she went missing. But of course, you know, you can't put these things together at the time. Uh, this was not figured out until much, much later. So he's a serious person to consider not only in Annie's, but in two other cases as well. Uh, the FBI profilers do say Larry fit the, the profile of the probable person responsible for possibly even several of these unexplained disappearances. I do want to go a step further, though, here, because we say he resembles the description of the man at, at the pub. I don't believe so. We also say that he fits the the FBI profiler's profile of the probable person. Right. Both of those scenarios, a lot of people fit both of those, the description and the profile. Yeah, but if you look at the sketch they made and you look at picture, a picture of Murphy, that's not the same person. Not saying that the sketch is correct. Hmm. I'm just saying I don't. If I think if you compare the sketch to a picture, um, it's not the same guy. When this dude was in lockup, the beast. When he was in lockup, uh, apparently he told some other guy that he did kill Deidre Jacob. Right. That he lured her into his car and killed her. But I do want to point out. The guy that comes forward and says, hey, he told me this, this is also another co convicted murderer. Right. So I think it's easier to believe that person on Reddit who says that taxi cabs were not that common back in 1993 in this area <sighs> than to believe somebody who we know has murdered somebody. Uh, but it's a possibility. Sometimes these guys get locked up. They get behind bars and they start trading war stories, so to speak. And um, even in some ways living out a little bit of a fantasy by telling these stories or hearing these stories. Before we move on here, Captain, I think it's important to point out that our expert that we keep referring to, and expert is the perfect word for this gentleman, Alan Bailey, he says he does not agree that Murphy should be named as a suspect in all three of the cases that we keep referencing. This is Annie Deirdre and Jojo's case. He told the Wicklow voice quote, it's dangerous to name him as a suspect. If we say that Larry Murphy did this, then people tend to exclude other possibilities End quote. I think that's just responsible. I, what he's not saying, please do not hear what he's not saying. What he's not saying is that he, that Murphy is not a suspect. He's saying it's dangerous to say he's a serial killer and we believe him to be responsible for X, Y, and Z. Right. And then therefore we're not doing our due diligence and we're, we're 
automatically ruling out other possibilities. Yeah, and another person that has kind of been brought up in the spotlight as far as the missing girls, all eight or all 15, is this guy Mark Hennessy because he killed a lady in similar fashion, Justine Valdez, Mm -hmm. and I believe he ended up, there. some people call it suicide by cop. Right. Because he was killed. He was a father of two. and Going out in the blaze of glory. He was found meeting these girls on Tinder. and But what happens is he, he looks pretty old, but he's 40. Hmm. So if you do the math, at, in 1993, he would have been 15. So if we believe that Annie went to this bar, if we believe that at all, we have her being reported by seeing with a guy that's 20 late 20s in his 20s yeah and yes this guy he's 40 and he's bald and and could he have been premature bald possibly but it's just one of those things that mark was in the news and it was a similar crime and so then people to sell newspapers go well we let's bring this guy up and talk about the eight missing girls yeah, and I mean, if he's 15, that doesn't, you know... Doesn't it, rule him out. Inside the realm of, of serial killers, uh, 15 is certainly an age that, that killing can start. It's rare. It's very rare. But I think where I have a little bit of an issue with it would be more so the fact of the... It seems like if he was responsible for Annie's disappearance... And then he murders in 2018 that there would have been other things that he would have done between that big gap right. in time. Well, he got married and had two kids. Uh, that's true. Maybe he was, he was busy with that. Right. But it's also weird because of the outcome, it's almost like once he knew he was going to get caught, I can't live anymore. Take my life. And so some people point that to evidence that he killed more than one person. Mm. And he was responsible for more things and that's why he wanted to die. I, I just don't see it fitting and again, I can't rule out the, the fact that somebody else came forward to say, we helped bury Annie's body. Right. And that really sticks with me as some, like I said, you have to come forward and claim that you did something wrong and you're putting yourself in, there's consequences for that. So if they would have done their due diligence, if they would have followed this lead, if they would have got the guy, maybe he's in America somewhere doing the same same shit for all we know. But it's like if they would have got the guy, that guy that came forward, he's going to get in trouble for something too. And that's why I put a little bit of weight onto what he says. I also put some weight into what the bouncer says because I feel like there's a conviction in what he's saying. Like I didn't know Annie, but once I saw her that she went missing, I know that that's the girl I saw that night. Mm-hmm. And he's been very adamant about it, and he has not changed his story. Now, one thing we've seen multiple times in these types of cases, unfortunately, is what happens here. The McCarricks divorced about five years after their daughter disappeared in Ireland. Annie's father, John, died not too long after that, never knowing what became of his daughter. Nancy McCarrick is resigned to the idea that Annie is dead. And she has spoken many times of wanting to have her daughter back, at least a grave to visit. She told the Irish son, quote, I'm pretty sure I'll never see her again. My greatest wish would be to be able to take her home to find out what happened really would be a gift at this point. End quote. In 2010, Nancy McCarrick was awarded a death certificate for Annie after court proceedings. She brought to have her daughter legally declared dead. Yeah. That same year, a friend and colleague of Annie, uh, Marissa Mackle, wrote an op-ed piece for the Herald newspaper about the release of Larry Murphy. She writes of her horror that a rapist and attempted murderer, a suspect in many abductions, someone who has refused any kind of therapy in prison, and who expressed no remorse for his crimes, was being allowed to go scot-free. She laments that Annie was confident and brash, but was also naive and trusting, often walking home alone 
at night after her shift. She writes that Annie told her of her love for Ireland and her convictions that she, that the lovely country was safer than her own. The irony did not escape the writer. In 2012, Larry Murphy appeared in a rare TV interview on Irish TV 3's show Midweek. He denied his involvement in any of the missing women cases and maintained that if the Gardee had any evidence connecting him to the cases, he would have been arrested. The woman he raped, but who managed to escape thanks to the hunters, invited those two men to her wedding two years later after her ordeal, thanking them on her special day for saving her life. According to a write-up for the Irish TV show Cracking Crime, there is a commonly held belief that Annie is buried somewhere either in the Dublin area or Wicklow Mountains. In May of 2019, and I don't know what, if anything, has come of this just yet, Captain, but I found this interesting and wanted to include it here. Last year, the Independent reported that FBI profiler John Douglas reached out to the Gardee to offer his help in solving the cases of the missing women. And again, we are stuck here all these years later, in yeah. Annie's case, 27 years later, and we have at least eight missing women, no bodies ever recovered, and the the leads are short, and the clues in the trail I mean, these are all cold cases by this point. Do, do you have one area or one theory that you lean toward or a suspect that you like? I know you've referenced the... The IRA thing makes the most sense to me. I mean, you have an organization that's covering up for people. And and again, a guy coming forward that could then be charged with you know, tampering with evidence could be... Uh, moving a corpse there there's a lot of charges that he could have been brought up upon and i know their system's different than ours but just because he comes forward and confesses that somebody else did it doesn't mean that he wouldn't be charged with a crime and again it's just look up how many accusations they have been covering up it's it's terrible well and i i, I find that interesting and i like that because there is weight there you know, the truth of that theory is that there, you know, be it just a, a witness or somebody implicating themselves as well as others, at least that's something where with everybody else that's mentioned, it's pretty much speculation. There's there's right. n there's nothing carrying those theories any further or those suspects any further where with with the IRA thing there is. I have something. My thoughts my suspicions are total speculation, but there's a problem, a big, big, big problem I have with this timeline and with some things that we know happened. Okay. And if we use a little bit of our thinking caps here, put them on tight and try to figure this thing out, I think it points in an, in the opposite direction that the investigation went. Remember once we have witnesses saying that we think we saw her on a bus, right? So that drives the investigation all the way out to the Ennis Carey area and away from her town that she was living in. I think the highly suspicious thing here is the groceries. You know, mm -hmm. she's, she's a baker. She's somebody that is good enough at baking. She's being paid by the restaurant to provide them with pies and baked goods and things like that. And I just think, to my own life, all of those refrigerated items, that would have been like priority number one for me in that moment to where I go, I feel like something happened to stop that process, that she was going about her chores and her errands for the day and something abruptly interrupted all of that. Right. And then possibly because she went missing, people coming forward saying they want to help. Yeah. And by coming forward, it draws the investigation away. And like you said, I think there's evidence, not just of the grocery store items, but the fact that she had clothes in the washer that didn't get to the dryer, um, the pie on the, on the countertop. It, it all appears like she's in the middle of a bunch of things at her house, 
where she should be safe. And then all of a sudden, all of those things, those actions stop. So either something drew her out of the apartment or something took her from that apartment. And that really cuts this timeline in half. Right. That really means that, that a lot of those things that were said to have occurred after the time that she came home did not occur, that those were not real sightings. It and, also doesn't mean that the IRA story is wrong. It could have just, just been a different person. But we don't have another account of a missing person that we know in that area. So here, here's where I go with, with that thought. I, I want to take it a step further. I I would love to know the... You know, when we talk about these cases, there's always like one person in there somewhere that you're like, I wish I could sit down with that person and get their firsthand account so I can try to figure out if I believe it to be truthful or not. Right. Or if this person's just trying to help, but they don't have great information. I would love to talk to this colleague, this person that somewhat knew her or maybe even knew her well that says that they saw her on a bus because where I remember, this is the person that it says I saw her, but we didn't speak to one another. Right. They go on to say that, that Annie was on the second level of the bus. This woman was on the first. She never sees Annie get off prior to her getting off. Right. What's missing from that story is, did she see Annie get on the bus? Because I start to call into question, if Annie's on the second level and I'm on the first, would I have even seen her at all? Right. So that seems a little weird. And where I want to take this a step further, where my suspicion immediately goes, which I hope that, you know, when you have a cold case, as we said earlier, you go through and you look for leads that were not properly followed up on. The first lead that I call into major question here, and maybe it was followed up on, we just do not have enough information to say so one way or the other. I question, I'm suspicious of this plumber guy because he is the one that says, I saw her leaving the complex. Well, his statement might only be believable because later you're believing she was seen at a bus stop and that she was seen on a bus. If we can prove that those other sightings didn't take place, why is this guy saying that she left her apartment complex at this time, but she left willingly and left a pie on the counter, wet clothes in the wash and in groceries that required right, but just refrigeration because, right, but just on because, the floor? Right. But just because this plumber saw her leaving the complex doesn't mean she was leaving to get on a bus to go on a hike. So again, his story could be completely true as well. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm saying that that would be the first lead that I would want to follow up on Mm. because there's a chance he's saying he saw her leave that complex because what he needs for his alibi or to not be involved is that Mm. he needs the investigators to believe that there's a witness that saw her leaving of her own free well, the, will one of the of reason, that, from that area. Right, but one of the reasons why they believe the plumber is that we have the next eyewitness saying we saw her flagging down a, a bus. So I, I don't know. Again, I uh, wonder. I true, wonder. true, but I already pointed out that those are unconfirmed uh, sightings. Mm-hmm. It seems like they believe those sightings to be real or at least one of them. But again, if, if those sightings are incorrect, then that's what that – really highlights the suspicion on this plumber guy because his story becomes believable because of those other later witnesses in the timeline. If we can prove that something happened to her before and that she never even went to the bus stop, then we got to, we got to draw a big circle around just that short time frame. It's just, it's just like two hours that we have to call in a question. It's very difficult. I think we both believe that when you look at all the missing women's cases, that 15 of them are probably not connected. Eight of them are probably not connected, but a handful of them could be. Um, I don't know if Annie falls into that scenario or not. I would argue not. But as far as like this Murphy guy, we, we have to do something with our system we have to start looking at things different. The, these individuals, these women that are assaulted and raped, they're living with scars for the rest of their life. And we're putting such 
small penalties on these criminals. And we know that these criminals, after they become a rapist, they're more likely to repeat their offense. And we, we need to do something to change that. And, and I was watching that show. Um, it was a, a series, uh, unbelievable. And they were saying, you know, rape is one of the only crimes that if, if you said, Hey officer, I got my bike stolen. They just assume you're telling the truth. It's one of the only crimes that somebody then combats you and says, oh, you were raped? Oh, really? Are you sure you're not making that up? They they wouldn't do that if you said, my car got stolen. You sure your car got stolen? You know, so we need to do some things to, to change this. And, and one of the other things is I think if if men could feel the way women do, and there was a threat to us. And there was a threat that I possibly could get raped leaving the house. Then maybe men would take it more seriously. And like you said, when you have, um, they call him the beast and they just let it, let him go. Um, I, I think that's ridiculous. Well, and I, I don't want to get into, I don't know the ins and outs of the, you know, the prison system in Ireland. But it's a dumpster fire. <laughs> as far as here goes, what I can say that has changed in the years is an individual like that here would have served the full fifteen. Yeah. Not gotten out after ten. To get out early, and I don't want to say never, because we have seen certain situations, you know, everybody's so proud of the fact that, that Texas is very very harsh and strict on their prisoners and they're very quick to put in a, a speed ramp to, to get you to the execution as fast as possible. They, they have only come to that because they learned the hard way. They were letting out violent criminals back in the seventies and in the eighties and nineties because of their prisons were overpopulated. And at some point they're, le- they're letting out the, the guys that, are nonviolent offenders. And then at some point the prisons are still overcrowded and they were forced to let out violent, violent individuals. Some of them who were previous murderers, some who went on to murder afterwards. So they learned the hard way. And now we have the Texas that we know and love today here today. What I'm getting at is if this dude, the beast, this terrible guy who I do believe is probably guilty of many more things. I don't know if he's responsible for Annie's disappearance, but I believe he's guilty of other horrible acts. This individual nowadays here anyway, would not be let out until he served the full 15. If he were to get out early, it would be because he did try to rehabilitate himself by taking classes and therapy and so on and so forth while he was in prison for those 15 years. Right. Again, though, with an individual like this, I'd like to bring up something that John Douglas told us. You can't really rehabilitate someone who has never been habilitated in the first place. All right. Do we have any recommended reading for this week? We do. And actually, I have a surprise for you, Mm -hmm. Mr. Captain. This is, uh, I'm really excited about this one. I've not read this week's recommended reading yet. So if it's terrible, I apologize, but I don't think it's going to be. <laughs> I'm excited about this one. It just came out like a week ago. It's mm-hmm. called a true story gone at midnight. The mysterious death of Elisa lamb, which we covered here in the garage. This is by Jake Anderson. And the surprise here, captain is, the copy I have in front of me has a note to you from Mr. Anderson. Oh, says, very cool. Captain, congrats to you and your team. I guess that's me and all <laughs> your hard work and success with the podcast. I am honored to have you read my work and I hope you enjoy the ride. Your friend, Jake Anderson. So go to truecrimegarage.com, click on our recommended page and you will see this fine book along with several others on there. And don't forget to check out our store page as well. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.